Hi there, I'm Cory Doctorow, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about creativity and where it comes from. So really, this talk is going to be about two things, coordination and possibility. Taken together, coordination and possibility are the secret engines of all human activity. They're the source of all human wealth, the root of every victory, every conquest, the underpinning of every revolution, from social revolutions to technical ones. So let's start with coordination. We all know what it means to be personally coordinated or uncoordinated. If your hand and your eye are well coordinated, you can see a ball and then catch the ball with your hand. Your eye can't catch a ball, your hand can't see a ball. If they coordinate, they can accomplish a kind of everyday miracle uh, through which they're able to pluck a ball out of the sky and do that calculus on the fly. If you're like me and you're a bit uncoordinated, you might find that when you try catching balls, you sometimes get them in the face. Uh, being well coordinated means you can do more. It means you can do things that you couldn't do if you weren't coordinated. Now, let's assume you were the best coordinated person in the whole history of the human race. Uh, you are the pinnacle of human potential. There's still not much you can do. The best coordinated person in the world can't build a skyscraper, can't cure a disease, can't govern a nation, or can't lay a road. These are all multi-person jobs. We call Clark Kent Superman because he can do more than one human can do all on its own. But you don't need to be from Krypton to be superhuman. All you need to do to be superhuman is coordinate with other humans and do more than one human can do to transcend the limits of an individual human. Now, way back in our evolutionary history, our distant ancestors hit on this strategy of becoming not superhumans, but super primates by teaming up together. Primates began to hunt together and work together to become super monkeys. Monkeys that could collectively, all at the same time, watch the kids, gather food, look out for predators, and pick lice out of each other's fur. And they did that by cooperating. Cooperating is really, really hard. If you've ever tried to get your family out the door or tried to get 20 people to pick a restaurant or tried to win at tug of war, you've probably noticed that despite millions of years of evolution and the manifest superiority of cooperating, of being superhuman, we really suck at it. For example, you take care of the kids, you watch for predators, you gather fruit, and I'm going to go inspect the back of my eyelids behind that bush over there. Um, we actually have this whole part of our brain, the neocortex, that's just there to make sure that the people we think we're cooperating with are actually doing what they say they're going to do, to keep track of our social relationships so that there isn't someone free riding instead of pitching in. Um, but it's not just because some people are lazy. It's also because we're not very good at communicating with one another. Uh, you know the old Warner Brothers cartoon? Uh, you know, there's someone uh, driving the last spike in the railroad, and he's, he's got the spike in his hand. There's someone else standing there with a hammer. And he says, all right, I'll, hold, I'll uh, hold the spike, and when I nod my head, you hit it. And, of course, the guy with the hammer misunderstands the guy with the spike, and instead of hitting the spike, he hits him in the head. We do this kind of miscommunication all the time in big and small ways, maybe not as dramatic as being hit in the head with a sledgehammer, but there are any number of times where, for example, I think you're waiting for an email from me and you think I'm waiting for an email from you and our superhumanness collapses. Instead of doing more than any one human could do, we do less than any one human could do because neither one of us ends up taking the next step. So the best theoretical basis for understanding the relationship between cooperation and collaboration comes from a guy named Ronald Coase, who's pretty interesting. To begin with, he's still alive and he's 101 years old. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1937 after writing a, a very important paper called The Nature of the Firm. Coase introduced in that paper the idea of something called a transaction cost. Uh, a transaction cost is the amount of money, energy, and time which are really all ways of expressing the same thing. You can trade money for energy, money for time, time for money, time for energy, etc. Um, the amount of that stuff you need to expend to get everybody to work together. How much time you spend saying, uh, did you understand me correctly? Do I understand you correctly? Did we get the secretary to take the minutes correctly? 
did we get the secretary to, to take the minutes correctly? Have we all taken the notes correctly? Have we approved the minutes? All that time we spend doing the boring stuff that lets us do the exciting stuff together, that's the transaction cost of working together. Transaction costs are really like a tax on the superhuman, right? They're the amount of time that we spend that isn't being superhuman that we spend so that we can be superhuman. Um, transaction costs are the reason that two people working together aren't twice as effective as one person on her own, but if you're lucky, they're like one and a half times as effective because the other half person is just spent coordinating, making sure you're working in lockstep. So the most amazing thing about Coase to my mind is that he lived to see the birth of the internet because if there's one thing the internet does is that it really just kicks the hell out of transaction costs. So just think of Wikipedia for a minute because that's a, a great example. Imagine the transaction costs that you would have had to pay before the internet came along to make Wikipedia. So imagine that like every Wikipedian has like a personal warehouse full of filing cabinets containing every Wikipedia entry and every edit to every Wikipedia entry and every argument over a Wikipedia entry. And then several hundred times a day, a fleet of trucks pulls up to the Wikipedian's house, every Wikipedian's house takes all those filing cabinets and takes all the stuff that's been superseded and replaces it with new sheets of paper and then takes all of the stuff that they've added and brings them back to like a central depository and kind of uh, collates them all and makes new sheets that then are fanned out across the world to everybody else who's working on Wikipedia. It's a kind of crazy idea. Um, it certainly means that Wikipedia would be completely impossible. Uh, but even if you could manage this, like even if you did it as kind of like a multi-trillion dollar art project, it still wouldn't be nearly as good as Wikipedia. For one thing, you wouldn't be able to search it. Uh, you wouldn't have anti-vandalism bots. You wouldn't have watch lists. I mean, it would be kind of nowhere near as good as Wikipedia. And it would cost millions of times more than Wikipedia, bill trillions of times more than Wikipedia, just to pay the piper, just to pay the transaction cost tax on that thing that we do together. Um, so Wikipedia and other projects that are on the same order of complexity, like the GNU Linux operating system, uh, those projects are a testament to what happens to, uh, to transaction costs when you add computers and the internet, how low they can go. Those projects are on the scale of something like a skyscraper. So imagine that you had like a patch of dirt and you decided you were going to make a skyscraper on it, but you were going to do it the, the new way, the internet way. So you said, um, hey, everybody, I've got this patch of dirt. And anyone who wants, you can come along. If you want to make a skyscraper with me, uh, come by, bring your architectural drawings, bring your ducts, bring your concrete mixers, bring your sand, bring your structural steel, bring your plumbing fittings, bring your furnishings, bring your window glass, anything you got lying around that you think would go nicely in the skyscraper. And we'll just kind of fit it together as best as we can. And anyone who doesn't like the way you fitted it can fit something different until we figure out the best way to make a skyscraper. And once it's built, 10 or 15 years later, it actually worked, right? Because that's what's happened with GNU Linux. That's what's happened with Wikipedia. 15 years later, we actually do have something as complicated as a skyscraper. And not only that, it's the greatest, most reliable, best designed skyscraper ever created. And more than that, it can be reproduced at no cost. And anyone who wants it can have it. You can have your own skyscraper. You can have your own Linux installation. You can have your own Wikipedia mirror. That's the age of wonders that we're living in. Thanks to what the internet does to make coordination easier. It makes us into a race of superhumans capable of collaborating like never before. So that's what I mean when I say collaboration is one of the secret engines of creativity of everything. Um, now let's go on to possibility. Collaboration is how possibility is what? So once you make collaboration cheap enough, you get astounding possibilities because it's now possible to do stuff like being a small operating system vendor or a freelance encyclopedia editor or an individual TV network and a million other job descriptions that a few years ago would have been as jarring sounding as a jumbo shrimp, right? Things that sound like a contradiction in terms, a small, bespoke, handmade, multinational corporation, that sort of thing. Um, when it costs billions of dollars to get from the earth to the moon, only a few things are possible. If that price dropped to 25 cents, 
a lot more things would be possible. It used to be that networks like the phone network were really expensive to change. Um, so you had a cool idea. So you had an idea for something like call waiting. Now, if you're young enough, you may not even have heard of call waiting because it's always been there for you. But you know, if you're an, an ancient 40 year old like me, you'll remember that there was a time when, when you called someone and they were on the phone, instead of them getting a beep and they get to say, hang on a sec, I'm going to see who's on the other line. Uh, you just get a busy signal. One day someone invented call waiting and they just sort of plugged it into the phone network, but they didn't just plug it into the phone network. The way that we got call waiting into the phone system is that the person who had the idea went to the phone company. Now, there was usually only one phone company per country, which made it easier in one sense. You didn't have to convince a lot of companies, but if they didn't like your idea, it was dead. So you go to the phone company and you'd say, um, uh, you'd work your way up the ladder to whoever was in charge of like adding features to the whole network. And you convince that guy, it was usually a guy, you convince that guy to let you reprogram all the phone company switches so that they could do call waiting. Now, as a result of that, the phone network that Alexander Graham Bell ushered into existence more than a century ago, not so vastly different from the phone network we have today in terms of the number of features we have. I mean, you know, you can count the number of new features like uh, automatic self-dialing and touch-tone dialing, automatic international dialing, call waiting, conference calling. I mean, that's it, right? You know, kind of maybe 20 new features on the phone network in centuries. Now, the phone network works pretty well, but the number of features in it is pretty low. The, the amount of innovation, the amount of possibility is pretty low. Now, um, the internet's designers didn't want to design a network like the phone network. They wanted to design something that they called the end-to-end -end network. That's a network where any two endpoints, any two people with phones, or computers, or whatever else you've plugged into the network, can communicate with each other without uh, anyone interfering with them, no matter what they want to say to each other, and no matter what application or protocol or program they want to use to communicate with each other. So an end to end network is a network where any two parties can communicate with one another using any protocol to send any message without having to get anyone's permission. So how did that work out in, in reality, right? They built this network, they kind of set it in motion, and in reality, it's worked out pretty good. So a guy named Tim Berners-Lee, who was a physicist in Geneva, he was a British physicist, but he was working at CERN, which is uh, the, uh, where the particle accelerator, the big particle accelerators are. And uh, Tim Berners-Lee, we call TBL now, um, uh, Neil Stevenson once said that um, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome is like the black lung of, of programmers and writers on the internet. And so we tend to wear things down to tiny little acronyms. So TBL, rather than typing out Tim Berners-Lee, TBL had a cool idea. He said, I wanna create a, like a hypertext system, a really simple one. All the ones that have been built to date, they've been slow to catch on, they're really complicated. Something really simple that'll let me share papers about high energy physics with other physicists. So he wrote a little program that would let you look at uh, um, papers, physics papers, and click on links in them or follow links in them. They weren't clicks so much as, as menus, but you could follow links in them. And another program that would host these files and then a little protocol to let them talk to each other and a way of marking up the files so you could show where the links were. And he called the, uh, the, the, this thing, he called it the World Wide Web. And then he went around to a bunch of other physicists and he said, hey guys and women, because by that point there were a lot of women in the sciences, which is great news. And he said, I've invented this really cool technology for sharing high energy physics papers. If you think it's cool, you can run a server, you can run a client, you can mark up your papers this way. And lots of them did. So many of them did that today the web exists. And it exists because Tim Berners-Lee didn't have to convince the Swiss phone company or the American phone company or the British phone company or any phone company that his idea was a good one. All he had to do was convince other people who might want to use it to try it out. And that's what happens to the possibility space when you have an end-to-end -end network. The amount of things that you can do becomes much larger. When you combine that with the fact that it's now cheaper to cooperate, not only do you not need anyone's permission, but it's really easy if someone else thinks you have a good idea for you and them to work together. So possibility spaces have exploded. End to end is about endless possibility, about the fact that you can create anything from instant messenger to email, from YouTube to the pirate bay, uh, from, from VLC to Tumblr uh, to Twitter without anyone's permission. So that's where we are today. We are now superhumans with endless possibilities.
Of course, it's not all sweetness and light here. There are plenty of people who have a stake in being the only superheroes in Metropolis. Plenty of people who would want to ensure that the endless possibilities are for them and not for everyone. Whether that's Verizon and AT&T who argue that they should be able to give priority to some services and not to others, so they have this idea that they want to block what we call network neutrality. Network neutrality is the idea that if you click on a link on a web page, your ISP goes and figures out what file that is somewhere on the internet and asks for it and gives it to you as best as they can. A non-neutral internet is one where if you click on a link on a web page, your ISP says, okay, what server, who, who owns the, the site where that, where that web page is, is located, and have they paid me a bribe to make sure that their service is delivered as fast as possible? And if not, we slow them down and we give priority to someone who has paid me a bribe. So imagine, you know, if this were like the phone company and pizzerias. So you've got like a little pizza on your corner that you really like, Vinny's Pizzeria, and then there's Domino's, you know, giant multinational. And you pick up the phone one day and you call up Vinny's because you want to order uh, pepperoni and mushroom. And you get a couple of rings and then a voice comes on the line and it says, this is AT&T. The number you have called is not busy, but they have not paid for a premium carriage. If you would like to be connected to this number, please hold. Otherwise, press one now to order a pizza from Domino's. Now it's pretty clear why Domino's would like this. But given that you've paid to have a phone put in your house and Vinny's have paid to have a phone put in their shop, both of you pretty clearly want the phone company to just let you two talk to each other. Well, a bunch of big phone companies think that the internet should work this way, even though we would never stand for it in the world of phones. They think that they should be able to give preference to some services over others, not based on how many uh, bits per second that company is paid to send, you know, how fast their internet pipe is, not based on what the phone company's customers want, what you and I want from them, but based on whether or not they've received a bribe. AT&T and Verizon are really big on this. Even Google has said, well, we want a neutral internet for like the real internet, but if you're accessing the internet over a mobile phone, we think that like bribe should be totally allowed. And they filed a joint comments with Verizon on this. These are people who clearly benefited from the neutral internet, right? Google exists only because literally a couple of guys in a garage from Stanford were able to compete with everyone else without having to have, you know, a kind of army of, of bribery experts go to all the phone companies and bribe them to make sure that Google's web pages loaded as fast as everybody else's. Um, but they want to pull up the ladder behind them. You know, every pirate wants to be an admiral. We can understand that, but we shouldn't forgive it. Um, so um, Apple is arguing that they should be able to control what, uh, what devices, uh, what software you, you install on your iPad or your iPhone. They want to say that if I own an iPhone and you've made an iPhone program, an iOS program, an app, and I want to buy it from you or you want to give it to me, even if there's no money changing hands, they say that it should be technically impossible and totally illegal for you to sell or give your creative works to me unless Apple approves it. And copyright law is kind of on their side on this one. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the, the American copyright law that was ushered in in 1998 to cope with the internet and computers, says that if there's a lock on a device, that only the person who put the lock on can authorize the removal of it. So even though you own the device and I made a creative work and you want to use it, only Apple gets to authorize it. And Apple won't authorize it unless um, we promise that they get 30% of the money. And sometimes they're totally arbitrary about it. Like there's, there was a Pulitzer Prize winning political uh, cartoonist, Mark Fiore, who uh, made an app of his political cartoons. And Apple said, I'm sorry, our guidelines say that... Um, if, uh, if, if you disparage public figures, uh, your app is not eligible for inclusion. And he said, well, you know, what? I'm a political cartoonist. That's my job. And there was a lot of kind of bad publicity that Apple got off the back of that. A lot of people like me kind of said, wow, this is an example of, of why it's a bad idea. 
to give companies a legal veto as well as a technological means to interfere with creators and their audiences. And finally, they were so embarrassed that they changed their mind. But that's a pretty crummy way to run a possibility space. You can do anything you want if Apple approves or if you're kind of good enough at playing the media that you can humiliate them. That's a lot less good than you can do anything you want. Certainly a lot less good for creators. And Apple's not the only one. There's lots of companies that really want to say that possibility space should be limited to things that don't offend them or that might not cost them money or that um, they don't find distasteful um, or that conflict with their ideas of an orderly marketplace. We really need to be aware of the fact that these people, what they're saying fundamentally is superhumanness for us, subhumanness for you. And that this is not only not good for creators, it's not good for anyone. Your future and mine hang in the balance here. We didn't get collaboration and possibility for free. And we didn't get them by accident. People set out to make collaborating easier. They set out to increase the number of possibilities that we all had. Now, we're not going to get to keep them without fighting. There are organizations out there like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Creative Commons, Mozilla, Fight for the Future, Demand Progress, the Free Software Foundation. These all need your support. They're all fighting to keep the network free and open. And without your help, they won't get there. And with your help, maybe they will. Enjoy the rest of your experience with Mozilla. And thank you very much for giving me a few minutes of your day today. I'm Cory Doctorow. Talk to you later.